Let's just jump in, man. That's what we do. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Hi. How's it going, Aaron? Uh, 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 great. Great. So, um, so on social media today, um, a, an article popped up that I thought was interesting. You Hope, Catholic. Yeah. Youcatholic.com. I'm not familiar okay. with this website. Not a website that I know anything about. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis has approved a revision third edition of the Italian Missal, including changes to the Lord's Prayer and Gloria. Um, just out of curiosity, are you sure that you Catholic isn't like the Catholic onion or something? <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you Google this, you get lots of hits. Okay. So this is, I think this is a real thing. So, um, the, uh, the Italian Missal, do you know what that is off the top of your head? No. That is I the, assume that's the mass in that's Italian. The mass. Okay. Exactly. Yep. That's the Roman mass. All right. The Missal Romano. Which I'm going to pronounce with an, with an exaggerated Italian accent. That's because fine, fun. because I've been watching the Godfather movies. Oh, yes. So, of course you have. So, for movie um, club. For movie club, yeah. <laughs> all right. But I'm all prepared for that. The, we could do the whole we, podcast. We could just do a Godfather <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, so, right. And look, the more I, I looked into it a little bit, and I realized that, you know, there's just this dizzying array of Catholic stuff that I just know anything about. But the... Like it says, yeah, the general history. the the general assembly of the Episcopal Conference of Italy, President Cardinal, President Cardinal, President Cardinal, <laughs> um, Gualatiero Bassetti, which is wonderfully Italian, announced the approval of a third edition. Okay, enough gushing about Italian. The Lord's so this is prayer, just a new translation of it is. For instance, the Lord's a, Prayer is a specific part. The vulgar Italian. Uh huh. Okay. That's an interesting way. That's right. It is vulgar. That's that's it? the that's the traditional meaning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, lead us not into temptation. Becomes do not let us fall into temptation. Although I would just like to point out that both of those have been translated into English. <laughs> so <laughs> fair enough. I, I accept. I accept. Uh, I accept that. But um, that does feel like something that should be pointed out. Right. My brother immediately pointed out this scripture, which you might recognize. Uh, oh, the JST. T. Yep. One, one yeah. Read it to us. Uh, this 14? Yeah. And suffer us... So this is JST Matthew 614. And suffer us not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's right. And um, the comment was that, you know, here, there, you know, Joseph Smith had it 175 years ago, the same translation, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool, yeah. right? Um, and lead us not into temptation. So that's instead... Do not let us fall into temptation. The difference being, the Lord doesn't actually lead us into temptation. Yeah. We fall into it. So that's the, that was cool. Translation, that's our topic today. Translation. Yeah. What do you think of that topic? Um, I think it's a significant one for a Latter-day Saint. Mm -hmm. um, because our entire, um, I want to say this, like our genesis, right? Our, our 19th century genesis is really founded on translation. And different forms translation can take and different ways God can talk to us through what we call translation. Um, we're going to talk specifically about, we're going to focus on the book of Abraham. Okay. Right. Because that's. Because it's I, illustrated I, and yeah. this is a podcast. Right. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> that's what you're saying is the perfect medium. <laughs> that's right. For, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> well, for the first episode of our show, I put in pictures. That's true. In the, maybe Embedded, I'll try yeah. to do that again for this one. Um, so. Right, because the book of Abraham is so interesting. It's not. I remember when I was a kid, looking at the vignettes. Right, because yeah. you know I'm in, I'm in Sunday school or sacrament meeting. I'm seven years old. I got my first copy of the scriptures at seven, yeah. which all the Brewster kids got. Mm -hmm. And at seven, at seven, oh. give you a year of preparation for baptism. Yeah. That's right. Okay, and I'm bored to death. And I'm looking for pictures in my book that I have in front of me. I find the maps. The maps keep me occupied for a while. <laughs> and this is before all the church history pic photos they have now. That's right. Now it's full of photos. Back then it was maps. You kids these days. Weird Egyptian pictures. Yeah. In the back of the. That's the right. Of the book of Abraham that were like, and they had they had mysterious words like, if anybody can discover the meaning of this, mm -hmm. you know, so let it be. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, fast forward to when I started, you know, looking into the subject, um, people don't seem to agree with Joseph's translations. No, there are um, alternate translations by people who have gone to a lot more school than he did. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, so that's where we're going to end up. 
how are we going to get there? So many options. Mm -hmm. Let's start with just the word translation. Okay. Trans Meaning. means across. <laughs> Lation. Lat is a that's a muscle and where is that? I don't work out. Lateral mu muscles. Yeah, where are they? Where are your They're lats? Opposite of your deltoid mu muscles. And where are those? Del deltoid mu muscles. I don't know. Up front, laterals in the back. Something oh, like, like that. it's it's in your back, the lats. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry, we're gonna cut this. Okay. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> we clearly don't know anything about musculature. <laughs> um, so yeah, translation. Translation is inherently complicated. There is a book, and by the way, if anybody knows what this book is, please let me know, mm -hmm. because I have been trying to refine it. Um, it was probably published close to ten years ago now. Um, the conceit of the book was there's a poem, mm -hmm. and they had four different translators translate the poem mm -hmm. and explain their reasons for the choices they made, mm -hmm. and um, four very different translations of the poem, right? Poetry is useful for this, okay? Because <laughs> we're talking about the problems of translation because what do you try to capture, right? So, for instance, in English, uh, poetry largely relies on the natural rhythms of English which is, um, in general, pretty iambic, and um, there are certain patterns that happen in American English, which are different. Like, even in Old English, like, poetry in Old English was based on how many hard syllables you had as opposed to the pattern of hard and soft syllables. If you go to, like, Japan or Korea, it has to do with, like, how long you hold the vowels, and um, if you go to a tonal language, it's completely different, right? So, these are things that don't directly go into another language. So when you're translating something, do you try to capture the sounds of the poem? Do you try to capture the meanings of the individual words? Do you try to capture the metaphors? And if you do that, do you try to do it literally? Or do you try to change them into something that would make sense to an English-speaking audience? Like, there are a lot of problems in translating poetry. It is not a simple task. So you get four excellent translators to do the same poem and explain how they ended up at such different poems. Mm -hmm. Where are um, the languages from and to? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. That's why I hope somebody can... Because I have looked and looked for this book because I really... Um, I want to use it in, as a teacher to mm -hmm. talk about the problem of translation, mm -hmm. but I don't remember what it's called, and I have not been able to find it. Like it's it's hard to it's a hard thing to Google. There's still some things that are hard to Google, and I have not been able to figure <laughs> out what the book's called. It all you got to get your search term. Yeah, it's unfortunately, not, the query is what's hard to find. Yeah, yeah. that right. And normally, I'm I feel like I'm quite good with my queries, but this one's got me utterly stumped. Like translators' poem different. That's <laughs> that's not going to help. Um, in genetics we use the terms transcription versus translation. Oh, interesting. Okay, so transcription is what happens when a cell divides and it copies the DNA. Okay. Translation sounds good. is what happens when you take your DNA and read it off and make uh, a protein Make a protein out of it. it, okay. That's right. So the useful. difference in those two words, I that's, think, is useful I really here. like that. I think that's a nice parallel, yeah. So translation inherently changes. Yes, I it think that's an important thing to understand. It inherently changes. Re the leaving meaning. religion aside, just understanding the concept of translation, I think that's necessary mm -hmm. to understand. Um, the, I have to say, the Wikipedia articles about Mormonism mm -hmm. are extensively researched. They're pretty good. And I think that they're also very fair. Thank you, wiki editors. I'm very impressed. Yeah. Um, this particular one, Joseph Smith's translation of the Barticle. Uh, of the, of the what? Sorry. Of the Barticle. <laughs> I'm not familiar this, with that one. This specific... Is, is that apocryphal or... <laughs> it's just, just a vertical, you know? It's, what, it's, what, it's a Bart Simpson article. Um, <laughs> okay. He really was ahead of his time. <laughs> this specific um, article says uh, the term translation was broader in meaning in 1828... Yes. ...than it is today. And Joseph Smith's work at the time considered a revision of the English text rather than a translation between languages. So here, talking about the translation of the Bible. And this ties back to our very first episode, right? Like, what does translation mean for right. the Book of Mormon? And, and we think about other kinds of translations. So, um, DNC 7 is allegedly translated from a manuscript written by the Apostle John. Mm -hmm. um, the Book of Abraham is allegedly based on... This papyrus. This papyrus, which is not the Book of Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, there's another papyral translation. I don't know if papyral is a word, but well, it is now. It. Um, that Joseph Smith did, which I believe the papyrus is lost, and definitely the translation, nobody knows if it was ever written down at all. Um, and the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is clearly something different from any of those other things. Like, mm -hmm. it's clear that translation is a pretty broad term to Joseph Smith. It is. It has very, it has lots of... Not to mention that we use the word translation meanings. to talk about, like, becoming some sort of immortal being. Right, so, we do use that if, phrase. 
as if yeah. it weren't busy enough already that word um the jo- let's start then with the with the book of um sorry with Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible okay because par- parts of it were clearly ju- are just specifically new right that sure did, that didn't exist book of Moses he did it yeah so the book of Mo- Moses is the best example right yeah um, Philip Barlow. This is again from the Wikipedia I know him. article. Oh, well, do. I don't know him personally. Oh, okay. But... Well, what do you know about Philip Barlow? Oh, he's a professor at BYU, and he wrote a lot of books. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. He was. Uh, I believe he. I believe he led the religion department for a while. Ah. He was still there when I was a student. I'm pretty sure. That's great. He observed that there were six types of changes that Joseph oh. Smith did okay? to to the J, to the Bible to the Bible. Got it. Okay. So the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible took like. I said mostly three years, right? But he never stopped working on it. But he never it. really stopped yeah. working on it, and he never really considered that it was finished. I don't know if it was finishable. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. One thing I'm really getting from studying this is that um, how hard Joseph Smith worked on these parts of our religion, right? Yes. It wasn't just like he sat down and he translated and then got up and, and he was done. put it away. He, stu- he, he tried a lot. He worked really right. hard on this stuff, and it's worth pointing it out hard for him that a lot of the DNC is comes from Joseph Smith working on the translation of the Bible. Yeah, about half, according to this. And so, he, as with other Smith's other translations, this is quoting. He reported he was forced to study it out in his mind as part of the revelatory process. Right. Yes. Okay. Let's before we talk about that. Here are the six types of changes: long editions that have little or no biblical parallel such as the visions of Moses and Enoch and the passage on Melchizedek. Right. So this is just new stuff that wasn't in the Bible. Which Mormons are always shocked to learn aren't in the Bible. Right. I've, I've <laughs> often found that, yes. <laughs> wait, wait, what do you mean? I, I, well, um, I've been in more than one conversation between a Latter-day Saint and another Christian where the Latter-day Saint assumes certain things about Enoch or Melchizedek yeah. that will just be common shared oh, understanding with the other Christian and they right, aren't because right. they're in the Book of Moses. That's right. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. The Book of Moses has all this other stuff. Um, specifically, it contains these these retranslations of the Book of Genesis, like this, yeah. how the earth was created good spiritually stuff. before it was created physically, stuff like that. Yeah, oh, we should do one on the creation sometime i have a lot of opinions about genesis okay. and that's and, the, and then of course we have these other versions in moses and abraham and and it's all very sciencey too that's yeah it. no i think it's i think it's great okay so it's okay common sense changes right and this is yeah an example of the one that we did earlier mm-hmm. um lead us not into temptation obviously he yeah god doesn't lead us into temptation. come on god so interpretive additions these are like or in other words harmonizations mm-hmm. reconciling passages although okay although if I could jump yeah, in here. Yeah. Sometimes it is quite the opposite of harmonizing. Like, for instance, there are a number of times where um, the Joseph Smith translation disagrees in some rather notable ways from the versions of those scriptures that exist in the Book of Mormon, where they're quoted in the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. So, so, and, and I don't, like, I'm not suggesting that disharmony is bad. I, mm-hmm. I think that part of the purpose of the translation of the Bible was to just see things in new ways. And... I have more to say about that later. But. Okay. Um, okay. Not easily classifiable, meaning the meaning has changed, often idiosyncratically, and grammatical improvements, you know, modernizations and yeah. things like that. So it was, he went through like the entire Bible from start to finish. Did he make it all yeah. the way through? Yeah. Um, but he didn't, you know, he didn't modify everything, but it was clear no. that he was working on it. He was going through again. Um, there's some interesting... Um, there's some interesting. There's not very much controversy, I think, about the Joseph mm-hmm. Smith translation. It doesn't seem to be. Except some people wonder. There's this Methodist theologian, Adam Clark, who had this a Bible commentary that may have influenced some of the JSP. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. But only some. <laughs> it sounds to me like he had a few sources and he was trying to work on this mm-hmm. classification. I know there's this controversy is long dead, uh-huh. but pre the 1978 version of the scriptures. Yeah. One of the reasons the church didn't use the JST is because the reorganized church had the manuscripts. Right, that's And we didn't really trust their versions, and then we started getting along better, and they shared them with us, and basically they'd been super accurate, and, mm-hmm. and it worked its way into the footnotes at that point. And mm-hmm. Yeah, right. We've had a good relationship with them ever since, really, pretty I mean, much. The history of this is that um, the Joseph Smith translation, uh, Emma got it, mm-hmm. okay, when they, the saints left Nauvoo, and that didn't go with them. 
Right. She gave it to Joseph Smith the third, and he gave it to you know essentially to the RLDS Church. Well, he sort of was. Yeah. Yeah. And then essentially, yeah. And so, and then it became just part of their canon. That's what the inspired mm-hmm. version of the Bible is that they, right. that they call. Yeah. I have a copy. And we only canonize parts of it, even though it's all by Joseph Smith. Yeah. We canonize JST, um, Matthew, mm-hmm. and um, the Book of Moses. And these footnotes, and that's about it. I don't. The footnotes are not canon. Okay, they're not canon. No, no, they have not been voted on as canon. Oh, what does canon mean? Canon in, in means it has been accepted by the body, like by common consent. We mm-hmm. all said that it was presented to us as we would like this to become canon, and we all raised our hand to the square oh, and so agreed that it's canon. Happened to the Doctrine and Covenants, I guess. Yes, and, the, and, the uh-huh. these, and the Pearl of Great Price and everything. Right, but not the footnotes. That is why Lectures of Faith was taken out of the. Scriptures. It, w- it used to be published in, in the scriptures, but it was never canon, so they took it out. Mm-hmm. Huh. Very, very cool. Okay, so not a lot of, not, not, I don't, like I said, I don't think there's much to worry about the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. It's when we start talking about the book of Abraham that things get a bit, yeah, I a think bit more interesting to talk I about. I get why people are more troubled by the book of Abraham. Um, I'm not really troubled by it. I'm not either. In fact, I love the book of Abraham, and I wanted to specifically quote the following essay. So the church has an essay on the book of Abraham. Okay. Oh, I'm not surprised. I just don't think I've read it. (laughs) So the gospel topics essays. Yes. All right. This is where they talk about things like polygamy, polygamy, race of the priesthood, mother in heaven and things like that. This is the part of the church website where they try to tackle these subjects. But here's the part on the book of Abraham. Okay. So, Book of Abraham, translated from papyrus, bought with some mummies. Yeah. And I was just like, what? <laughs> the whole thing is wacky. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, like, huh? it's, it's such like 19th century, right? what, what like, in the world Why does this guy have a bunch of mummies and, okay. he stole them from Egypt. And, it was the 19th century. Exactly. Like, yeah. I mean, that's the only, I mean, the articles don't say that they stole them from Egypt. But come yeah. on, that's what they did, right? I mean, yeah. They didn't consider it that at the time. But... Yeah, it was just archaeology. <laughs> I don't even know if they considered it that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it just, and this I found dude, some cool stuff and I was able to get it out. This dude toured them around the U.S., right? And was selling yeah. them off and was like saying, look at my mummies and here's all this other papyrus. And, yeah. And anyway, he was ready to get out of the business. They came through Nauvoo and the leaders of the church were there like, yeah, this, we, want, we want that. Mm-hmm. And so they pooled some money together and they got yeah. it. That's just <laughs> wacky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good times. So anyway, um, here we go. But, so the Book of Abraham and the vignettes. We're going to talk about each of those kind of separately. Yeah. The Book of Abraham, here's the quote, clarifies several teachings that are obscure in the Bible. Life did not begin as birth, as is commonly believed. Yeah, that's more clear in the Book of Abraham than anywhere else. Right. And here's the scripture that I especially like. Um, Abraham three twenty two through twenty three. Ah, oh, that was scripture mastery back in my seminary days. I hit it. I don't have it memorized, but oh, okay. fortunately, <laughs> the friends at home can't see that you have it open on your laptop. <laughs> now the Lord had shown unto me Abraham the intelligences that were organized before the world was, and among all these there were many of the noble and great ones. And God saw these souls that they were good, and He stood in the midst of them, and He said, "These I will make my rulers." For he stood among those that were spirits, and he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou hast chosen before thou wast born. Awesome. None of the papyrus that we have that was recovered from the great fire in Chicago has these words this, on it. Everything about the book of Abraham <laughs> is like, it just has everything. This story has everything. Yeah. <laughs> but this language is some of my favorites in all the scripture. Yeah. All right. Many great intelligence. Abraham was there. All these people, I'll make my rulers. LDS Church hinges critically on this scripture. Yeah, it's significant stuff. I remember when I was on my mission and I talked to this guy and I told him that we lived before we were born. I said yeah. it matter-of-factly because it's the first sentence of the fourth lesson, right, of the discussion. It could be. I don't remember what came it was. in what order. So. We lived before we were born. You're younger than me. It's like, and you had to memorize... Not by yeah. much. <laughs> a few days, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had to memorize the discussions in the first sentence. We lived before we were born. I said it manufactly to this guy because I've said it a hundred times. Mm-hmm. And he just looked at me and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's a crazy yeah. belief, yeah. right? 
No, I think, is there any other church besides, you know, a Christian church that has that belief? I don't know about doctrinally. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there are, um, well, there, there's the verse in Jeremiah about, about, um, you know, the one. It was, it was in the, Jeremiah it was in the was margins of that. No. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> um, no, the one about how I knew thee before thou was born. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. like and, hmm. um, and it seems like I, I've seen that latched onto by anti-abortion people um, as being about fetuses. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we used it as missionaries as sort of our Old Testament proof that we weren't totally unhinged. Right, by the scripture. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of the things that a lot of people feel instinctively, even though it's not. Sort of like we talked about... Um, Believing in eternal families is pretty common, even though it's not doctrinal. Right. It's instinctive is a good way to describe mm -hmm. it, right? Um, okay, so, Book of Abraham is full of stuff like this. Um, continuing on. Um, prior to coming to earth, individuals existed as spirits. In a vision, Abraham saw that one of the spirits was likened to God. This divine being, Jesus Christ, led other spirits in organizing the earth out of materials, or pre-existing matter, not ex nihilo. Nihilo? It's nihilo. Nihilo? Or out of nothing, as many Christians later became to believe, right? We believe that yeah. we took materials There's so many primary existed. lessons based on the book of Abraham, which we almost never read. Right. Abraham further learned that mortal life was crucial to the plan of happiness God would provide for his children. We will prove them herewith, God stated, to see if they will do all things, whether the Lord their God shall command them, adding a promise to add glory forever upon the faithful. And here's my favorite part of this quote. Nowhere in the Bible is the purpose and potential of the earth stated so clearly as in the book of Abraham. Yeah. Hard to disagree with that. It's like my favorite, it's one of my favorite pieces of scripture. And yet it came from this papyrus. Okay. And yeah. We, and we can't discount that. And if we're going to be apologizing as apologists, <laughs> we're not really an apologist. I'm not, no, we're not apologists. I no, don't think. I don't, I don't think that's an accurate way to describe us. Because at the end of the day, um, he could have read a gum wrapper and gotten the same revelation. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a matter of being a seer, right? Like, you're able to see... Why don't you go into what you just said a bit more? About seeing? Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole idea of being a seer is this expansion, right? This expansion of reality. And, like, um, I think I think the greatest example of a seer in Scripture might be Enoch. In the book of Moses. In the book of Moses. Who, you know, ties right into our discussion anyway. Mm -hmm. But Enoch is shown this vision of everything from the beginning to the end and the personality of God and so many things that there's no other way to see other than having God show them to you. And ultimately, I mean, if Joseph Smith isn't even looking at the golden plates when he's translating the Book of Mormon, why does he need to look at a papyrus to learn about Abraham? Right. Um, revelation comes as it comes and... Translation is a really fluid term for Joseph Smith. I don't think he knew that many verbs. <laughs> Doing some translating. <laughs> so, right. I mean, that's really that's really the long and the short of it. What's well, really the short of it? The long of it is that there's a papyrus. Yes, and it's the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and it's pretty cool. And I think this is where the most tr like tricky aspect of this comes from, is like the images, the facsimiles, they have actual meanings. Um, outside of the footnotes in the triple combination. Um, and that is the part, I, I think that's the troubling part, right? Because this is clearly not inspired by something else. It is that thing. Um, of course, you know, anybody who works in literature can tell you that a symbol can do more than one thing. But mm -hmm. um, it is sort of does sort of raise the question, like, what's the point of of having meanings for the these images like why why is that necessary i don't have a good answer for that critical appraisal of the book of abraham wikipedia it is long and it is compelling okay <laughs> so you got to skip past the early criticisms because they didn't really i don't think they really had everything locked down but what it does is this wikipedia article goes through each one of the facsimiles and mm. compares joseph smith's explanation to an explanation by the current Egyptologists, right? Yes. For example, um, here we go in facsimile, facsimile one of number one. 
Dear listener, if you look at your phone right now, you'll see facsimile number one. Which was, as Joseph Smith explained, Abraham, uh, Isaac on an altar and Abraham about to... Wait, no. Sorry, I got this wrong. Abraham's on the altar. Abraham is on the altar and he's about to be sacrificed, right? Yes. By, and like there's this bird-like figure up in the upper right corner and um, uh, Joseph says it's the angel of the Lord, but the Egyptologists say it's the boss spirit Osiris, miscopied with the head of a bird rather than that of a human. You know, I have, you know, that that's kind of, kind of perfect and beautiful in a way, mm -hmm. because if we're going to go to the one story, right, and all, all myth is archetypal and telling the same story, mm -hmm. Egypt has its stories of, you know, the God who was killed and resurrected. And um, so why shouldn't Abraham, like, play this role symbolically for his own ancestor or his own descendants? Okay, so this is the best, um, the best reasoning that I have behind behind what you're just behind all this. So let's back up a bit from okay. what you're saying here. So Joseph says that this is a representation of Abraham about to be sacrificed by an idolatrous priest. Okay, that's what he says. That's what he says. Egyptologists look at this and they say that it's Anubis and Osiris, mm -hmm. right? And there's these canopic jars and there's. Um, this uh, crocodile, right? And they have, they have, and they can read the the hieroglyphs that are surrounding the 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 the, uh, the picture. Yeah. Although they say sometimes the in Egyptian writings like this, the picture is away from its commentary, so that may not be represented. And there's holes in the papyrus that we have, mm -hmm. like on the head of the bird, right? And the, one of the arguments is that Joseph just filled in the head of this bird, right? And same yeah. with the head of the the head of the um. Of the, the dude, of the dude is just missing. So, and th what you were saying is that it's possible for both things to be true, right? Yeah, as someone who works in literature, like, <laughs> I'm very comfortable with this idea. Mm -hmm. Why don't you? Do you want to go into it a bit more? A bit more? <laughs> well, I'm trying to decide if I should read the thing I brought. Okay. At okay. this point, I think maybe I will. Okay. Um, this is from Letters to a Young Mormon by Adam S. Miller, a book I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. It's inexpensive, it's short, it's excellent. Um, I'm going to read a couple paragraphs, uh, not sequential paragraphs, from the chapter about scripture. Okay. Joseph, Mr. Miller says, always expected more revelations, and translation was one vital name for the hard work of receiving them. For Joseph... Translation was less a chore to be done than a way, day by day, of holding life open for God's word. Translating scripture is a way of renewing life. In translation, we lend our lives, our minds, our ears, our mouths, to the local resurrection of old texts, dead words, and lost voices. We put down our stories and take up theirs. And as we give voice to them, they, for a time, rejoin us in the land of the living. It goes on to talk about how... Um, Joseph produced the translations of the scriptures we have, but he argues that the work of translation is unfinished, and I think this is a really important idea just when thinking about how words work. Like, words are dead. Like, a book doesn't mean anything unless somebody reads it, mm -hmm. right? And and the reader, there's, there's this collaboration between the reader and the writer, and nothing is real or actually happening unless the reader is taking action for meaning to be created. And um, I think that's what translation really is. Even when you're reading something in your native language by a contemporary of yours, there's still the translation of creating meaning from something that another human mind in another time and place wrote down. Wikipedia is kind of a beautiful example of this. Like, there are thousands of people, perhaps, who've worked on this article. Maybe, maybe not thousands, I don't know. Um, but a number of people, in a number of different ways, all collaborating to create this document. And this document is meaningless until someone goes to this website and looks for meaning there and finds it. And it is dizzying. When you go down the rabbit hole, right, it is very easy to approach the subject of the vignettes and put them in into just made up town, right? Sure. Into made up yeah, a, yeah. into made up a Rura, which is in, <laughs> which, as I learned on the British trivia show QI, yes. is a real place. There is an act 
<laughs> made up a rura. I'm glad. <laughs> okay, so it's very easy to just write these off. Obviously, these Egyptian characters don't match the meanings that Joseph Smith said. Yes. But if you start going deeper, it's much more complicated, right? Right. And one thing about Joseph Smith in translation is he never thought it was finished. He didn't believe in a finished translation. It wasn't just the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible that wasn't finished. He was constantly like improving and reworking the Book of Mormon. He was, um, one of my favorite examples is he was slowly, like with every publication, he was changing everywhere it said that the people were white and delightsome to fair and delightsome. He didn't think white was the right word. He thought, hmm. he seemed to think that skin color was missing the point. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wish that, um, mm -hmm. and, and then for a while, some of his, his uh, successors turned it back, and then in 78, they moved it back to the way Joseph Smith was changing, changing it. Mm -hmm. He was never done with the Bible. He was, I, I doubt that he would have considered himself done with the book of Abraham if he'd lived longer. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that Miller says when it comes to um, translation is, is he talks about translation as a form of repentance, that every time you go back to the scriptures, if you're reading them right, the scriptures will bring you up short. They'll call you into question. They'll challenge the way you understand the world and force you to retranslate the world as you attempt to understand the scriptures. It's interesting you, you describe it that way. Um, reading the scriptures, specifically the Book of Mormon, was hard when I was a kid. Yeah. The language, the language, <laughs> That's not crazy. <laughs> is, well, I'm specifically talking about like First Nephi. Right? Yeah, okay. First Nephi is among the easiest parts of the scriptures to read, I think. Okay. In terms of its language. And yet it was so different than my 1980s language that I had that it was still yeah. hard to get into. If you leave out the names and the, of people and places, the mm -hmm. Book of Mormon has a very small vocabulary. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's easy reading, but Once, but in terms of the actual words, it's not that hard. I was still essentially translating that text right from its kind of old Englishy. It still is a bit old Englishy, sure. Right to even though it's m more modern than like like the, like the New Testament, right? It's still a bit of yeah. translation, and then you hit the Book of Second Nephi, <laughs> right? Then you crash into the Isaiah chapters, right? And now nothing makes any sense at all because Isaiah is is so hard to read, right? Yeah. And so... Which even Nephi trans, admits. It's Right, exactly. It's all translation. It's changing the words to create a meaning that fits inside your head, right? Yes. We can't trivialize the fact that there are Egyptian symbols here that don't appear to match. But what's important is that... In fact, I think it's dishonest to pretend that's not true. Right. The article, the essay... That's not essay, testimony building. It's not testimony building. The article specifically says, the essay on the church website, none of the characters on the papyrus fragments mentioned Abraham's name or any of the events recorded in the Book of Abraham. Mormon and non-Mormon Egyptologists agree that the characters on the fragments do not match the translation given in the Book of Abraham, though there is not unanimity, even among non-Mormon scholars, about the proper interpretation of the vignettes of these fragments. Right? Scholars have sure. identified them as funerary deposits. It was a long time ago. Right. We will never fully be able to. And that's what they say at the end of this. It's possible we'll never really know how this all came to be. Mm -hmm. One thing that I really like that they mentioned is that it was 1,500 years between Abraham and the carbon dating of these papyrus. <laughs> right? It's a long time. It says, Wait, which is older? Abraham. Okay. By lot. Okay. Yeah, well, years. it's an important detail. <laughs> so the, these stories on these papyrus fragments could have been mis totally mistranslated, and Joseph Smith is just restoring to us the um, re original, right? Yeah, I mean, 1,500 years is a long time. That's an apologetic reading of this, of course. Yeah, and, and again, I don't think it matters, but... The essay concludes with this following, right? The veracity and value of the Book of Abraham cannot be settled by scholarly debate concerning the book's translation and historicity. The book's status as scripture lies in the eternal two truths it teaches and the powerful spirit it conveys. The book of Abraham imparts profound truths about the nature of God, his relationship to us as a children, and the purpose of this mortal life. So, is that good enough? I think, like a lot of things in faith, it puts the responsibility on the faithful to grapple with it. And I, I think this is true of this whole idea of translation generally, like whether it's Joseph Smith's translation or our own personal translations, ultimately we have to grapple with what is before us and through faith we have to find meaning in it. 
all right, well, I'm with you. You know, I'm a, yeah. I love these scriptures, but at the end of the day, there's a translation, and it doesn't seem to match. Right? Yeah. So, I just, I love these. I love this stuff, but I don't know how to. I can list five different re- ways to reconcile it, and we kind of have already. Yeah. Right? We've talked. We've talked about how he's actually giving us the original translation, or the Egyptologist might just be wrong, right? Yeah. Or there's stuff missing from the papyrus that got burned in the fire, right? Or these all feel very head and sandy, right? They all. They all do. Yeah, I don't I'm, have a good answer. No, for this. and I. I think that's the point I most want to make is that um, wanting a religion that takes away all this grappling and ambiguity is inherently an untruthful religion. I think, I, I think that the nature of trying to be mortal and understanding the eternal is always going to result in complications. And, and this is a particularly great example because there's no way to misunderstand the book of Abraham as anything other than complicated, anything other than other than what it seems, right? It's, it's, um, there's no pretending that this is a perfect um, word-to-word uh, mapping from Abraham himself, who wrote this in his own personally made ink, right? Like, that is not what's happening here. We have to deal with the fact that it was thousands of years ago. We have to deal with the fact that it was made by people who didn't care about Abraham. We have to deal with the fact that people who um, are of good intentions and doing the best they can and know way more than me or you agree that it is not the book of Abraham. There is no way to look at the book of Abraham and and pretend that it's anything other than complicated. Mm-hmm. And but and but it's got these scriptures. The Lord shown unto me Abraham yeah. the intelligence that were organized. And that is ultimately the value, right? Like ultimately, I mean it's the same thing with the Book of Mormon. I, I find the story of the Book of Mormon very compelling and hard to argue with. Um, I just don't. I don't. I don't see a reasonable way to suggest that Joseph Smith made up the Book of Mormon. But, and there's no evidence, right? There, we don't have a copy of the Book of Mormon, which experts agree is not Nephi. It's so like there, it's not. It's it's it's. There's a lot more. There's a lot less faith required in a way because there's no physical objects. <clears throat> oh, that's a really good point, right? We opened with the Joseph Smith translation. Mm-hmm. It's not hard to just say, okay, I get it. Yeah. He was a prophet. Joseph Smith was a prophet, right? And he dictated new parts of the Bible, right? Sure. Right. I mean, if I, there are lots of people that are, that don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you accept that he's a prophet, you can accept that he could just dictate new scripture. That's just what right. a prophet does, sure. right? There's no physical evidence. Yeah. Right? There's we don't have, right, the original book of Moses. No. Right? Here we've got the papyrus. Yeah. Right? We it can look at it. Doesn't seem to track. <laughs> it doesn't seem to track. This just all goes back to the South Park episode. <laughs> yeah, I saw that in your notes and I'm I I've never made it through a South Park episode. Okay, at the end of the Mormon South Park episode. Yeah, the okay. one that Joseph Smith is in. The one that Joseph Smith is in. Yeah, never made it through that one either. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, how, that's how difficult I find them to deal with. <laughs> I've only seen that. I've only uh-huh. seen like two South Park episodes, and that's yeah. one of them. Because I have the same feeling. I just can't do it. I just don't think they're funny. <laughs> this one, at the end of this one, one of the, what's really great about the South Park episode is that um, there's the main South Park kid right who's obviously a non-member non-member he's not a mormon right i wouldn't think so <laughs> and um he's learning about them right? okay he has a friend that's invited him over to fam- this, family home this is cartman i'm asking because it's the only name i know yeah let's just pretend it's cartman. okay oh no there's a kenny it might or be. kenneth I know. definitely not Kenneth. okay <laughs> yeah. right there's he two. has this mormon friend and invited him over for family home evening and it's just a great family right yeah and he goes wow what is it like being a mormon and so he learns all about like 116 pages uh-huh. um, lost. I mean, that's a whole other episode. We could do that episode. But pretend it was the book of Abraham. And he comes back and he starts explaining this story to this this Mormon kid. Yeah. And the Mormon kid's like, yeah. Yeah, I lost the pages. Yeah, there's the book of Abraham. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. And he's like, wait a minute, you Mormons, you know this story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still Mormons? Yeah. Yeah, we kind of just take Joseph Smith at his word. Yeah. 
Well, and that's all any religion is, right? Like, you want me, you expect me, wait, 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 wait. You're Christian and you know that Jesus died, right? <laughs> right it's true. <laughs> you know that and you're still Christian? <laughs> There's nothing harder to understand here yeah. than there is about the fact that Jesus defeated entropy. Right. <laughs> it just happened more recently. <laughs> um, and there are more um, artifacts. I think artifacts make faith more difficult. And not the other way around. Yeah. Like, what other artifacts are you, are you thinking of? Um, Besides, like, the seer stone, for example, or the... Which well, I right, actually yeah. love that one. I don't think that one Yeah, I don't think that one's a problem. But, but I mean, there's no... Um, you know... I, there is no Holy Grail. The mm -hmm. Shroud of Turin was not Jesus wrapped in, right? Yeah. Like, all the, there are no actual artifacts from Jesus' life. Historically speaking, it's a very difficult argument mm -hmm. to prove that Jesus existed. So, you know, we're starting from faith. Mm -hmm. Most of the scriptures were written long after he was supposed to have been alive, right? So, um, in fact, I think that, and this is why some people are terrified of, like, Bible archaeology or... Um, second Isaiah or uh, learning that the revelation of John was written like what, like 300 years after Jesus died or something. The more we have artifacts and knowledge of the reality of things that exist, um, the more faith has to um, grapple with stuff that we know. Like it, I, and this, this is almost like, this is a very a religious argument to suggest that faith and knowledge are opposites, which I don't believe. But I do believe that a mature faith has to grapple with knowledge. And sometimes knowledge doesn't fit into what we think we understand so easily. But I want the artifacts. I want, no, I'm not anti-artifacts. I want the evidence. I just think we have to recognize that when you have artifacts, when you have actual living human beings who left evidence behind, um, they're going to be actual human beings. And we didn't even cover this stuff in the Book of Abraham, like the language of it and the... Um, the Plural gods, for yeah, instance. The, well, the, <laughs> and the, there are many things in there that Joseph could not have known about and that were discovered in archaeology, you know, mm. you know, 100 years later. Stuff okay. Like that. There are instances of this that are nicely, nicely prophetic. But the more I think the more artifacts I can get my hands on, the better, right? Yeah, I'm not suggesting that artifacts destroy faith. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that they can if, you're, if your faith is based on not knowing something. I think a faith that's based on not knowing something is a very dangerous kind of faith to nurture. Yeah, it goes back to the end of this, the end of this quote, right? The book of it, truth of the book of Abraham is ultimately found through care, through careful study of its teachings, sincere prayer, and the confirmation of the Spirit. Yes, like any scripture. At the end of the day, the eighth article of faith of our church is. We believe the Bible. No, you got to sing it, man. Come on. I had never learned the songs. You do you know the Bible, songs? Okay, you are younger than me then. Because I was a blazer my last year of primary <laughs> when that new songbook came out. We never did any of those. Also, the songs are all terrible. I will go on the record. Oh, Every single no, one listen, of them is bad. I'm, I'm not going to argue it. <laughs> <laughs> we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. Right? Yes. And we also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. Which people often like to point out that the Book of Mormon doesn't have that caveat that the Bible had. Yeah. You could very easily understand the grammar of that sentence to suggest that the Book of Mormon is in the exact same slot the Bible is. I, I would agree with you 100%. I didn't used to think that. I used to enjoy the fact that the Book of Mormon wasn't part of that statement. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I think I would swap the order and um, just agree with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's lots, been lots of lexical and changes to the Book of Mormon. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Translation. It's um, you could kind of base our entire church on it, to be honest. And I, I really coming back to what Brother Miller said. I really think that he's right. Like ultimately, the act of faith is translation. Like taking what God gives us and having to recreate it for ourselves in a way that works in our own spiritual life and our own spiritual practice. Translation is the act of being a creature of faith. You have to retranslate all the time. If you're not translating, the works are dead and they mean nothing to you. 